Hello everyone, thanks for joining us at the table today. I'm Chef Troy Conway, and with 35 years of food service experience, our company Faithful Food Concepts looks to offer our guests customized menus, inspired cuisine, and a great experience. I like to say that we offer regionally and internationally inspired cuisine that's locally executed. We're here today on the show, we're gonna do some local favorites, uh, maybe some things that you haven't seen before. So we're gonna start with a chilled roasted vegetable display. Uh, we're gonna follow that up with a Eastern Shore favorite uh, with a Maryland blue crab cake served on a brioche roll and a homemade aioli. Uh, we're also gonna have for dessert a mixed berry shortcake on a homemade buttermilk biscuit and fresh whipped cream. So sit back, loosen your belt, uh, just hope you enjoy the show. We're gonna start right in with our chilled roasted vegetable display. All right, everyone, we're gonna get started with our chilled roasted vegetables. Uh, this is a very uh, simple dish. Uh, it incorporates a lot of flavors. Most are flavors that you're familiar with, you have in your kitchen, you don't have to go out and buy anything special. Uh, and these are all vegetables that people tend to gravitate to for eye color, uh, for taste quality, uh, and just for the, the simple fact that they hold up well uh, for multiple styles of meals. Uh, so we're gonna get started. Uh, we have red peppers, uh, we have yellow squash, zucchini, uh, we're gonna do fresh asparagus, eggplant, and red onions. Very similar in texture. Uh, we're gonna slice some and we're gonna dice the rest, marinate those in our seasonings, our olive oil, and then we're gonna plate that up uh, on the oven rack. All right, so first we'll slice our squash. Uh, we're gonna use our knife and our bear claw grip. Uh, we're gonna slice that uh, about half inch to a quarter, quarter inch thick. Uh, we're gonna roast this in the oven. Uh, so it needs to be thick enough that it holds up from the heat. We're gonna roast it just until tender. We're not trying to cook it all the way done because once we roast it, we're gonna chill the vegetables, allow them to cool, to be handled, and then you can plate them up as you desire. You can actually do this earlier in the day, the next, or the previous day, and then plate it up for whatever meal you're gonna use it for. No reheat necessary, obviously. I like to stage the vegetables on the sheet tray uh, together. You don't have to, you can more than welcome to mix them all together. Uh, but I think I find that this helps them cook a little more evenly. And then when you go to plate up, you have everything in color coordination to make it easier on your finished product. We'll do a few more zucchini there. You don't wanna stack it too high on the sheet tray, give it room to breathe. Uh, you don't wanna have that steaming effect of your vegetables. That'll help continue the cooking process uh, once it's finished. So you want it to be nice and level so that it gets a little bit of color This is uh, one of the most popular dishes that I get requested to provide on a buffet for my catering business. Uh, it's always a surprise to me, not because of taste quality or anything like that. I'm just always amazed that people choose a, a vegetable dish of this sort as one of their favorite items. You always tend to think people don't, don't eat vegetables, don't like vegetables stay away from vegetables, but uh, I've had this display used as an appetizer, uh, also as main vegetable on a hot buffet, even though it's a chilled item. So it is very versatile in that regard. Clean that up. We're trimming out the membrane on the, the peppers there. Uh, they tend to be a little fibrous. They don't add any true flavor to the dish. Uh, so it's generally beneficial. It's a little bit less eye appealing as well. So we're just gonna trim around that light colored membrane there. Asparagus has a natural breaking point uh, that you can, if you're doing it one by one, you're welcome to just snap it. It'll break on its own where it's ready. Generally speaking, you can, where the purple starts to run out into the green, 
is a good rule of thumb of where to cut. The bottom part of the asparagus is very fibrous, very tough. Uh, some restaurants go even higher and just use closer to the tip. But this is the very most tender part of the asparagus and that's safe to eat. And you can do this very precise as far as your cut, if you choose to. My daughter always laughs because I tell her when we're cutting certain vegetables, uh, there's, I always say there's beauty in the chaos. <laughs> so again, no precise cuts necessary. Very rustic. Gives it the look we're going for. And of course the flavor is gonna speak for itself. Okay. All right. Then we have eggplant. Not always a fan favorite is eggplant. It kind of gets the short end of the stick. I like it because it's a similar texture to mushrooms. So if you like mushrooms, uh, eggplant is a good substitute or addition to a dish like that. Um, just little half circles are fine. We'll lay those out. You can do this same presentation, just all diced if you like. Uh, but I find slice makes a nice presentation for a platter and on a plate. All right, so now we have our assortment of vegetables. And again, I said the seasonings are very common household items in your kitchen. Uh, we have extra virgin olive oil, black pepper, salt, uh, Italian seasoning, and onion powder. So we'll give a generous drizzle of the olive oil. I didn't purposely pick the slowest pouring uh, bottle of olive oil that I had just to torture you. Uh, so we're going to sprinkle a little kosher salt. This is all to taste. You know your own taste. You know the taste of your guests. So be mindful of that. That goes for any, any type of cooking. Know your, know your audience. Uh, a little black pepper. We're going to mix this around once we get it all coated. So being a little more generous initially is fine uh, because you're going to lose some of the seasoning uh, to the sheet tray. And we have Italian seasoning. Again, be generous. Now, if you like a stronger garlic flavor, uh, we're using garlic powder today, but if you use minced garlic, uh, that is definitely gonna give it a stronger garlicky flavor. If that's the sort of thing you like for yourself and for your guests. Again, we're gonna mix this all in. So might look a little funny now, but we'll get it, we'll get it situated. I'm gonna throw a glove on just because, for our purposes, but you're more than welcome to just do this by hand, then wash your hands after. So you're just gonna make sure everything gets a generous coating, salt, pepper, Italian seasoning. If you need a little more olive oil, you can do that. It's no problem. You just don't wanna saturate it so that when it comes out of the oven, your vegetables are soggy. Uh, and it makes it more difficult to plate up. They tend to fall apart a little easier when they're oversaturated with the oil. And you still want people to feel like it's a healthy, a healthy option. We have our oven set to 375 degrees. Probably gonna take about 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, depending on how fine you cut the uh, vegetables. Uh, you just wanna check on it periodically. Again, you're just cooking till tender, not so well done, because they're gonna continue to cook as they cool in the refrigerator. So let's go ahead and put these in the oven and then we'll be right back. Okay, so we're back. Uh, we've roasted our vegetables around 10 to 12 minutes. Uh, we've allowed them to chill. Uh, I have a commercial refrigerator at home. You're not gonna wanna take your hot pan and shove it into your refrigerator. Uh, so allow it to cool first on the pan, uh, on the stove top, on the countertop. Uh, and if you choose, you can transfer it to a platter, plate, put it in the refrigerator that way so you're not bringing the entire temperature of your refrigerator down, uh, and then allow it to chill that way. Uh, give it at least an hour to chill so you can handle it and be comfortable plating it up. Uh, and then we're just gonna go ahead. While we were away, uh, we blanched some green beans, boiling water, allowed them to chill or ran some cold water, or you can use ice water, bring the temperature down to shock them. Gives it that nice, bright, vibrant green color. 
makes them tender to chew. Um, and then we seasoned it the same way, olive oil, salt, pepper, garlic, Italian seasoning. Uh, so we'll use that as a part of our plate up. Sometimes I use sugar snap peas, also very showy, bright in color, good flavor. All right. And you can plate up any way you like, any platter you like, uh, and then just, you know, make it, make it your own. You know, that's really what it comes down to. You're the one doing the cooking, but it's, it's also your design. You just want to incorporate everything that you did. That's all. Again, these are well seasoned vegetables. They're all tender and makes it for a great presentation. And if you notice, when we put the onions in the roasting pan, they were stuck together. After they roast, they separate into their layers just fine. You don't have to worry about that. There you have it. Vegetables fit for a king. Chilled roasted vegetables. Next, coming up, we're going to introduce our Maryland blue crab cakes. Pan fried, served on a brioche bun, lettuce, tomato, and some homemade aioli. My company, my catering company is Faithful Food Concepts. We are on the eastern shore of Maryland. Uh, and on the eastern shore, if you've ever been to Maryland, uh, blue crabs rule all. Uh, it's a local delicacy. You can get it up and down the east coast, but everybody attributes that to when you come to Maryland, you gotta get blue crab. Uh, you can get crab cakes, you can sit down and pick the crabs for hours on end and not be full, but uh, that's how we do it in Maryland. <laughs> so let's get started. Uh, here we have our lump crab meat. Uh, and there's different kinds of crab meat. You can get lump, back fin, jumbo lump, special, claw, uh, all different variations. Some have different flavors uh, than others. It just means you're going to be picking a little bit more shell out of your crab meat during the process. Uh, but lump is a nice medium of both. Uh, Maryland crab meat has a little semi-sweetness to it when it's cooked. Uh, then you kind of boost it with flavor as you season it with uh, the things we're going to use today. So we have dry mustard, Worcestershire, lemon juice. Uh, we're going to put some fresh parsley. Uh, Old Bay seasoning, which is pivotal to your success in making a good crab cake. Uh, it's a seafood seasoning. Uh, garlic powder, uh, mayonnaise, and I like to use panko breadcrumbs. Uh, there's tra more traditional recipes that use cracker crumble. So you could grind up your own saltines, uh, do a cracker crumble like that in place of the panko bread combs. So let's get started with our process. Uh, we have one pound of lump crab meat. Uh, I tend to use one egg per pound of crab meat. Uh, there's different ways you can make what they call a slurry or your batter for your crab cake, uh, but I use one raw egg. Uh, it's about a teaspoon to a teaspoon and a half of Worcestershire sauce. About the same amount on lemon juice. Dried mustard is about a tablespoon of dried mustard. You can do more or less on depending on your preference. Dried mustard does give off heat. Uh, so if you put a little heavy handed on the dried mustard, it will add a kick. If you've ever had that hot mustard at a, a Asian restaurant, that's basically what it is, giving it the heat. Uh, so we'll do, it's about three quarters, half a cup to three quarter cup of mayonnaise. We're gonna save some of this mayonnaise uh, because we're gonna make an aioli sauce to go with our crab cake. About a teaspoon of garlic powder. And about a tablespoon of Old Bay seasoning. Again, to flavor, Old Bay does have a little saltiness to it, and in the right portions, it will have some heat also, so you don't want to overpower your guest or yourself. Put some fresh parsley in there for color and freshness. Just a sprinkle of black pepper. Best way to make a crab cake is to get in there with your hands. So we're gonna glove up real quick. We're gonna make our mixture, uh, and then we're gonna patty these up into the portions that we need, and then we're gonna refrigerate it to allow it to sit. We've got our 
ingredients mixed in, then we'll add our breadcrumbs as needed. I generally start with a half a cup, and then I work my way from there. Um, you don't want to put too much panko or cracker meal or whatever you decide to use uh, because you don't want your crab cake to be mealy. You still want it to be fairly light. You don't want to bite into it and the only texture you have uh, is that mealiness from the binder that you used. But you also don't want it to be so soft that it falls apart when you try to cook it uh, from the raw egg and the mayonnaise. So you, you, just enough to get it to hold. Then again, we're gonna patty these up and allow them to sit in the refrigerator for at least an hour. Uh, you can do this a day or two in advance. Uh, and that will just ensure that, help ensure that they don't fall apart during the cooking process. You can broil crab cakes or bake them in the oven. We're gonna pan fry ours today, uh, just for time purposes. Uh, and it also utilizes some butter and some high heat. And of course, we know butter adds a little bit more flavor. And you don't get that when you're boiling or baking in the oven. So we're gonna pan sear ours with some fresh butter. We'll make about a three ounce portion, three to four ounce portion. You can also make these a little smaller into a crab ball. You don't wanna mash it down in this stage. Just enough for it to hold, to hold its shape while it refrigerates. That one's a little big. That's mine. Give these other guys a little bit more. So we're gonna pop these in the refrigerator again for an hour to a day to two days in advance uh, until you need them. Just cover it with some plastic wrap and let it refrigerate to set. All right, we're back. Uh, our crab cakes have had time to chill in the refrigerator. Uh, again, you can do that a day or two in advance, but at least a minimum of an hour or two if you can. We're going to present ours on a sandwich. We have some nice lettuce and fresh tomatoes. Um, then we'll make our garlic aioli with Old Bay and some of that dry mustard that we talked about earlier. Uh, but first, we're going to go ahead and pan sear, pan fry our crab cakes uh, with a little melted butter. We've got the pan heating up, so we're going to move to the back and get that done. All right, so we have um, about a tablespoon and a half, two tablespoons of butter. We're gonna let that get situated. Turn the heat up, about medium high heat is good. You're gonna wanna get a good sear on the crab cake. Um, one side nice golden brown before you flip. Uh, and again, the crab cake does have raw egg in it. Uh, so you're looking, overall you're looking for an internal temperature of 165 degrees at least. Uh, but if you put two good sears on this crab cake and it's not overly thick, that shouldn't be a problem. If you're baking it in the oven, uh, say 350 degrees to 375 degrees, you want to allow about 20 minutes on a minimum uh, to get to that 165 degree temperature. All right, so let's move our butter around the pan. Again, this melted butter is just gonna ensure that we have a ton of flavor on our crab cakes. Put those in one at a time and give it a little press as we put it in. And you can see they're not falling apart, holding together from the time that we allowed them to set. And while these crab cakes are cooking, we're gonna finish our uh, garlic aioli, put that together for our sandwich. All right, so, Aioli traditionally uh, is a garlic and wit oil emulsion. Uh, more, more common now, uh, you find mayonnaise or flavored, any flavored mayonnaise is considered an aioli. Uh, so that's what we're gonna do today. Uh, we're not gonna just do garlic and whipped oil. Uh, so we're gonna add some of that dry mustard that we had earlier to give it a little bit of that heat, a little bit of that bold flavor. We're gonna add some lemon juice to give it that nice freshness to balance out the seafood. I'm gonna sprinkle some parsley just for color and freshness. We're gonna put some garlic powder in there. And we'll use some of that good old Eastern Shore 
Old Bay seasoning. If you've ever been to Maryland or talked to anybody from Maryland, you hear a lot of people say they put Old Bay on top of their Old Bay. So there's never really too much Old Bay for somebody from Maryland. But again, know your audience, know your guests. We're just going to whip that around until all the ingredients are mixed. Got a beautiful aroma coming off of these crab cakes in the pan behind me. It's tortured at the moment. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to put a little bit of that on our the base of our brioche roll. Uh, brioche bread is a traditional way to serve a crab cake. Also, you don't have to, but it is a traditional style to serve a crab cake sandwich in Maryland. I have everything ready for our crab cake. We'll go back and flip these uh, crab cakes over and make sure we're doing okay. Nothing wrong with the brown butter. That'll give it a richness on its own. All right, so we'll let that cook for about two more minutes and we should be good to plate up. All right, we've got our crab cakes are all finished. We've got a nice golden color on both sides. Uh, cooked all the way through 165 degrees again to make sure that we've cooked all the egg properly. Uh, we're going to go ahead and plate these up. Again, on our nice brioche roll on top of our bed of garlic and Old Bay aioli. Fresh tomato. Some beautiful red leaf lettuce. All right, coming up next, we are going to do uh, one of my favorite desserts. It's a mixed berry shortcake made with a homemade buttermilk biscuit and topped with homemade whipped cream. So get yourself ready. If you still have room, we'll be right back. Okay, welcome back. Uh, Again, this is one of my favorite desserts. It's a mixed berry shortcake, homemade buttermilk biscuit, homemade whipped cream going on top. Uh, so we'll get right to it. Uh, we have an assortment of berries here. You can use whatever you like. Uh, in Maryland, strawberries tend to come in season late April into May. That's the ideal time to do this dish from then on through the summer. Uh, but anytime you can get good berries, this is a welcome treat to your guests. Uh, so we have blueberries, raspberries, blackberries, and we're going to slice these strawberries real quick and add them to what we already have. Uh, so we'll cut the tips off, cut the caps, excuse me. Cut all those off. Just give it a little simple, simple chop. Again, it doesn't have to be overly precise. Uh, just, you don't want to make it too large for your guests. Keep it in, in line with your other berries also, size-wise. We're going to sprinkle these with some sugar and a little bit of honey and allow those time to uh, macerate in the refrigerator. Uh, that's going to help the juices release, adds a little bit more of its own sauce, if you will, to the dessert. We'll mix those all together. A couple tablespoons of granulated sugar. We're going to do a light honey drizzle. This just adds a little bit more sweetness. It'll help give your uh, berries a little bit more sheen after they release some of their own juices. Again, we'll allow this to sit in the refrigerator. You can do it the same day, it's fine. This needs a little time to let that process take place. So we'll get that in the refrigerator. We'll be right back to start making our biscuits. Okay, so we have our berries in the refrigerator. We've got sugar on them, a little honey allowing them to juice. Uh, we're gonna dive right in and start with our buttermilk biscuit. Uh, this recipe uh, is one of my favorite biscuit recipes. Fell in love with that a few years ago. Uh, ends up producing a product, nice fluffy buttermilk biscuit like you would see on a fast food commercial or a breakfast commercial for any restaurant that you can think of. Uh, but it calls for bread flour and pastry flour. Uh, some stores you may be able to find pastry flour as it is. Uh, I could not in my local grocery store, so here's a hack for you. Uh, to make pastry flour, you take equal parts of all-purpose flour and cake flour. And as 
many bakers know, or you might know yourself, uh, a better way to get a more consistent product when you're baking is to measure by weight. Uh, so if you have a scale, great. If not, you find yourself a nice little cheap digital scale so that you can weigh your ingredients. Uh, that's something I learned over the years. Uh, you get a much better result in your product. Uh, so this recipe calls for everything by weight. Calls for equal parts. Now, this is all-purpose flour and cake flour to make our pastry flour. Uh, so we'll mix those two together, equal parts. Then we have the same amount of bread flour. Different flours contain different amounts of protein, and that's why you use different flours for uh, different recipes. Uh, those proteins produce different amounts of gluten when they're mixed, uh, and so on and so on. It's quite the chemistry lab experiment. can get very technical if you allow it, but those are the basic uh, rules of thumb there. If you look on your package of flour, you'll actually see different protein levels. Uh, bread flours will come in several different, depending on the type of bread. Uh, we also have baking powder. That's the rising agent in this recipe. And we have salt. Again, all of these ingredients are weighed out. And we have sugar. So we're gonna mix those together. If you have a sifter, uh, you can sift your uh, flour and your dry ingredients together. That helps add a little bit of air uh, to the process. The biscuit method is gonna uh, add butter. This is a traditional French recipe is where I learned this. So uh, the French love butter. This recipe is no different. It calls for a lot of butter, almost two sticks of butter in these biscuits. Chopped up into small dices, probably quarter inch to half inch dice. We'll use, uh, this is a biscuit cutter. Uh, and that's made for uh, just mixing the butter into your, into your flour. You're gonna do this until you get a dry crumble and small bits mixed in where the flour is attaching itself to the butter as it mixes. So we'll do this for a couple minutes until it's well mixed. We'll come back and continue with our next step. We have our butter is cut into, and you can use shortening for this recipe also. I forgot to mention that. You can substitute uh, shortening lard uh, in this step. As long as you have some sort of fat agent, uh, we use butter. But you get these nice flaky granules that the flour is attached to itself to. Nose help in the baking process, gives it the moisture that it needs while it's baking. Uh, so our next step, um, we have our buttermilk measured out. We're gonna add that, mix it in. Uh, and if you need to add a little additional flour, biscuit batter is a moist batter when it starts. Uh, so if you need more, just keep a bowl of the bread flour next to you. Uh, you can use that on the counter and you can use it in your mixture as needed to help give it some hold. So we'll take our scraper and we'll start folding that, that buttermilk into the flour before we roll it out onto the countertop. This is not the time to be shy. Uh, you wanna get right in there. You know, you're gonna play with your food or use your hands and get to know it a lot better. But I tell you, it'll, it'll be worth it when you're all finished. All right, so we've got our buttermilk mixed in. We'll sprinkle a little flour down on the counter give us something to work with, and then we'll roll this right out. Just do a little bit at a time. You don't wanna put too much added flour down all at once, but you do wanna utilize everything that's in the bowl because that has all of your mixing agents in it. It has your salt, your baking powder, uh, your sugar, and the types of flour that you can bind, the pastry flour, bread flour, and so on. Uh, so continue to do what you did with the scraper Try to fold it together so you can get it into a nice ball that you can mold. We'll start bringing this together. This takes me back to uh, most people's humble beginnings. I won't say most people, but a lot of people's humble beginnings, sitting in the kitchen, working with mom or grandma, helping them make whatever particular item it may be. It could have been a baked item, a pie, a cake, could be biscuits. All right, so we've got our, our dough is coming together a little bit here. Uh, we're gonna take one moment, we're gonna grab our rolling pin, uh, and clean up our surface area and get back to it.
I like a nice, big, hearty biscuit. Definitely a quarter inch. If you want to shoot more towards a half inch uh, on the dough thickness, that'll give you a nice rise in the oven. Uh, so you have your cutter, you can cut it to whatever size. You can do mini biscuits. Uh, you can do larger. If you're making sandwiches or something like that, you want to use a larger cut. Uh, but we'll, this is the size we're using today. When you cut the biscuits, you don't want to you want to go straight down and give it a little shake. You don't want to do a lot of extra twists with your cutter. You don't want that to damage the biscuit. So we're going to put that there. Give it a little shimmy. See, that's the thickness you're looking for. Already feels like a nice biscuit in your hand. Parchment lines baking sheet. Space these out a little. Uh, you don't want to discard your extra dough, obviously. Uh, you can continue to reform and make more dough, or excuse me, more cutouts until your dough is gone. Uh, for our purposes, we're going to leave it like this. And we're just putting enough on top uh, so that it gets a little color in the oven. You don't want to, you don't want to drown the biscuit at this stage. You can always add more at the end if you like, but this stage you're just putting a little bit on top for color, flavor. Not really looking for it to run down the sides or anything of that nature. Butter in the biscuit, butter on top of the biscuit, butter the biscuit when it's done if you like. Good old French recipe, gotta love it. Uh, biscuits cook at high heat, uh, so we're gonna put this in the oven at 425 degrees. Uh, if you have a lot of biscuits on your tray, don't fear. Uh, I always tell my kids and my friends, biscuits are social. They don't mind being close together. They generally don't stick when they bake. They normally, that will tend to help them rise straight up. So you can put them very close together right next to each other as they go in the oven. We'll do that, we'll be right back. Okay, we're back. Our biscuits are finished baking, about 15 minutes at 425 degrees. Nice golden brown biscuits. Uh, we made our own homemade whipped cream while we were away. Uh, it's heavy whipping cream. Uh, use a hand mixer, uh, add powdered sugar and vanilla extract to taste. You can even sprinkle a little cinnamon. Some people get real fancy and put a little gram of yay or something like that in there to change the flavor profile. But this is just very basic. But it's a recipe you'll never go back to buy a store-bought whipped cream. And then we have our berries that had time to sit. As you see, that honey gave them a nice shine that we were looking for. We got a little bit of juice in the bottom of our pan. Uh, we'll use that as we drizzle and dress our biscuits. Uh, so let's go ahead and get that done. Take a nice biscuit here. Just cut it in half. A light, flaky biscuit. Still got steam rolling out. Uh, who likes just one? Let's put two of them on there. Nice biscuit. Use a little bit of our mixed berries. Again, very, very easy, simple dish. Um, and you can use store-bought biscuits if you like, but you can tell people you slaved over it if you made the homemade biscuits. It just adds that much more appreciation to your dish. Let's see if we can get a little juice out of there without making a mess. Yeah, there we go. We'll just finish that off with a little whipped cream on the side. Nice, light, fluffy, homemade whipped cream. And there we have it. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Chef Troy Conway. Uh, it's been a pleasure serving you. You're welcome at the table anytime. Uh, feel free to reach out to us on Facebook, Instagram. Uh, we look forward to taking care of your catering needs. Take care.